Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I think we're going to give latecomers just have to walk in. Does anyone know anything more about the strike? Does anyone know what's happening or not happening? Does anyone hear anything? Still in the air. Still up in the air. They're still meeting. I don't know the meeting. The meeting session. Yeah. I, I mean, sure. but we don't know what's going on. Okay. So I have to do something slightly rude, which I never do, and I apologize. <laughs> but just to ask this year's fellows, we we're having a reception afterwards, to which you're all cordially invited, and we hope very much you stay. But I just want to ask this year's fellows if you could just meet in my office. For just a couple minutes, we're going to drag you away from your own reception. A couple minutes right after the question and answer session and before the reception. We will reemerge. It's not mysterious. It's just to try to figure out our plans for our workshop for county and you know, um, what we should do vis-a-vis -vis the strike and stuff like that. So I apologize for that interruption, but if people will just do that really quickly and the rest of you join to have the reception, we will join you shortly. I, this being almost the end of the year, I have only one further future event to announce, um, and that is the, a meeting of the Forum for Research on Law, Politics, and the Humanities, which will take place in the Institute on Wednesday, April 14th from 3 to 5, and it will feature a paper um, called Reading Resistance, Three Options and a Choice of Numbers by Nicholas Brown. And we will be, um, of course, distributing that paper. So if you're interested, please come. It tends to be a very lively group. So now it is my very, very pleasure to introduce Constance Meinwell, our speaker for today, um, and the last fellows lecture for this year. Fortunately, there will be some next year, we have just found out. <laughs> <laughs> After a lot of help from our friends, all of you, so we appreciate that very much too. Connie received her BA summa cum laude um, with honors in philosophy from Yale in 1981, and she went on to earn a PhD in philosophy from Princeton University in 1987. She came to UIC as a lecturer in the philosophy department, which I didn't realize, in 1986, and she is now associate professor. In the last several years, she's also taught as a visiting associate professor, both at Cornell University in 1995 and more recently at Barnard and Columbia in 2001. In addition, Connie's been a junior fellow at the Center for Hellenic Studies and received a University Scholar Award from UIC. And this year is her second stint, I am very happy to say, at the Institute for the Humanities. Connie is, of course, a philosopher of classical Greece, and she has lectured widely on the Platonic dialogues at universities all over the country, including the universities of Chicago, Indiana, Wisconsin at Madison and Milwaukee, and Texas at Austin, as well as at Columbia and Princeton universities. Connie's also served on the planning committee for the American Philosophical Society, and she has helped to organize two Chicago area ancient philosophy conferences, including one on philosophy and religion in ancient Greece in 2006, and a second on beauty, harmony, and the good in 2008. Her essays on Platonic dialogues and on Stoic epistemology have appeared in such journals as Ancient Philosophy and Phronesis, or Phronesis, I'm not sure the pronunciation. In addition, she's made contributions to the Oxford Handbook of Plato, as well as the Cambridge Companion to Plato. Connie's book on Plato's Parmenides was published by Oxford University Press in 1991. At the moment, Connie has a great deal of work in progress, mostly concerning Plato, including Reason and Literature in Plato's Republic, and Two Notions of Consent, written for new directions in ancient philosophy. This year at the Institute, she's completing a long-term project, a book on Plato for the Rutledge series of philosophers. And one of the most interesting aspects of Connie's forthcoming book is its scope, I think. She explains that most contemporary treatments of Plato con uh, concentrate on specific dialogues and or take uh, approaches to formalizing arguments. In contrast, Connie's book will range widely over all of Plato, focusing on his most important thing, uh, themes. Plato's discussions of juicy topics, she says, including eras, the examined life, the theory of forms, censorship of the arts, equal job opportunities for women, 
and the immortality of the soul have inspired and pushed not only philosophers, but artists, writers, theologians, mathematicians, and the general public over several millennia. Today, she's going to give us an example of her approach by focusing on the Phaedo, and her talk is entitled Soul Matters, Plato's Phaedo in Historical Context. So, Connie, great welcome to you. Well, thank you, Mary Beth, and I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Between the weather and all the political stuff that's going on, I really appreciate that anybody was able to make the time to be here. And of course, I can't start my talk without saying um, how grateful I am and how much I've enjoyed this year in the Institute, and I'm so glad to hear that we'll carry on next year. Okay, as Mary Beth mentioned, uh, today's um, Today's discussion of the soul and the Phaedo is part of a much bigger project in the course of which um, I'm trying to paint a really big uh, picture of Plato. Um, but yeah, Mary Beth already gave you the idea that the, uh, the soul is one of the themes and I'm going to be looking at it in the book in both the Phaedo and the Republic, but today's topic is uh, just the Phaedo, because there turned out to be so much to say about that once I put it in historical context. Okay. In today's world, most uses of the word soul, such as his playing lax soul, or I really love soul food, are not meant literally. Serious talk of the soul is reserved for specialized religious and theological contexts populated by distinctive communities that accept a raft of commitments many in our secular society would prefer not to make. Many philosophers dispense completely with considering the soul, and if it were a subject of philosophical discussion, the first thing to get clear about would be if we even have a soul, whether there is any such entity as the religious tradition takes the soul to be, let alone whether we should identify ourselves with it or take it to be immortal. The Greek psyche is not only the ancestor of our notion of the soul, but also becomes the entity that psychology is the study of. And this is a discipline with an extremely wide allegiance among the very population that's now so inhospitable to the immortal soul of the traditional religions. Yet, of course, psychology as a discipline need not be pursued in a way that remains true to its word formation. In its present breadth as a discipline, psychology floats free from the notion that there's an entity, the psyche, that it studies and may seek to help. There certainly need be no commitment to the further claims that this entity is in a substantial sense a part of the composite that a human being is, this part being the subject of our emotions, moral characteristics, and intellectual activity, and our truest self, which is independent of our body and lives on after our death, then to be rewarded or punished according to our deserts. Yet Plato's treatments of the soul present us with a veritable goulash of all of that. <laughs> with all this, though, our initial challenging question, why should I believe there is such a thing as the soul, makes no sense in Plato's time. To understand why, as well as to appreciate the development of the notion of the soul in Plato's works, it will be indispensable to start with some understanding of background to this matter from Homer up to the time right before Plato's activity. Okay, so we get to start with Homer. While translators sometimes render psyche by soul in Homer, as in later Greek, there's an important sense in which, as James Redfield put it, a Homer has no knowledge of the soul. As we'll see in this section, he speaks of the psyche only when people are dead, and even then, on his basic conception, it lacks any significant capacities. Far from considering the psyche to be our true self, Homer seems rather to identify the body with the person, and indeed, the psyche is no more than an insubstantial likeness of the body. In light of this, I'll stick to the transliteration of psyche for this archaic context. Let's consider the situation now in some detail, because it will turn out to be a little more complex than what I just said. It's a striking fact that in Homer, the word psyche is used only in connection with the death or fainting of a human being. At death, the psyche leaves the body behind and goes to Hades. From among myriad texts, we can take the opening of the Iliad, where we learn that the theme is the wrath of Peleus, son Achilles, 
that baneful wrath which brought countless woes upon the Achaeans and sent forth to Hades many valiant psychas of warriors. When we hear of psychai that have left the body, they described piteously. Thus, Achilles exclaims in connection with the death of his comrade Patroclus, alas, there survives in the Hall of Hades a psyche, a mere phantasm with no wits. In what sense is the psyche a phantasm? While no longer possessed of the substance of corporeality, it's an apparition in the literal sense that it gives the appearance of the living person. Thus, Homer tells of the psyche of hapless Patroclus in all things like his living self, in stature and fair eyes and voice, and the raiment of his body was the same. Psyche are called shadows or shades and are likened to smoke, shadows, and dreams, presumably because we're familiar with the way these can take the shapes of things without their reality. A psyche cannot be embraced and bodiless must be generally incapable of physical action. The occupants of Hades are often called strengthless heads of the perished dead. As is natural, given their status in the same category as smoke and shadows, Homeric psychi are normally without wits or mind. Homer, in the main, does not identify these phantasms with the original heroes. Thus, in our opening quotation, he famously continues that baneful wrath which sent forth to Hades many valiant psychos of warriors and made themselves, contrasting with their psychi, made themselves to be a sport for dogs and all manner of birds. That is, themselves here clearly refers to the dead bodies by contrast with the psychi that have gone to Hades. Odysseus' narration of the advice Circe gave him about his consultation of the psyche of the prophet Tiresias and also of the consequent necromancy episode is carefully composed to maintain consistency on the points we've been considering. Circe informs Odysseus that he must reach the house of Hades and of Reverend uh, Persephone, there to consult with the psyche of Tiresias the Theban, the blind prophet, whose wits stay unshaken within him, to whom alone Persephone has granted intelligence even after death, but the rest of them are glittering shadows. This reaffirms that without special dispensation, the psychiatry in Hades lack mind and wits, noas and frenes. Book 10 and the first part of Book 11 stress the need for the drinking of sacrificial blood if the witless wraiths are temporarily to recover the original person's memories. Without this infusion, what Odysseus takes to be his own mother, but is really only her likeness, her Adelon, cannot recognize him. But after a point, the blood, which is in a fixed location, is no longer mentioned. Book 11 goes on to include meetings with Psyche who are able to recognize and converse with Odysseus without sanguinary aid, and to show Odysseus observing the punishment of famous sinners, Sisyphus, Tantalus, and so on. And in the final book of the Odyssey, when the Psyche of the slain suitors arrive in Hades, the occupants are shown in full possession of their memories, making judgments, recognizing new arrivals, and so on. From the point of view of our present inquiry, these passages are confusing. We can't help asking, wait, are these the original guys, and do they have their wits after all? But the passages make sense in terms of what the poet is doing, composing a song for the entertainment of an audience, not writing a metaphysical treatise on the psyche. And by the way, I did not mean to insult Homer by this. Um, and in fact, um, if anyone wants to talk about it more, I have tons of quotes from uh, the Oxford Commentary and Mondadori Project of Hoybeck, as well as from Jasper Griffin, where they say that themselves in connection with many passages, including some on the psyche. So uh, yeah, he has, he has poetic reasons um, for including these episodes written the way they are, and those outweigh um, any feeling that he should regiment everything he says about the psyche to fit the basic picture. OK. So we may suppose generally that including such episodes as the cameo appearances by favorite characters from the Iliad, the set piece of the punishment of the legendary sinners, and the climactic meeting with Heracles count for more with the poet than any tensions between the way these must be presented and his official treatment of the psyche. To return now from the underworld, we should consider how our epics describe those capacities of living persons we ourselves have come to consider psychological. We find pervasive mention variously of the heart, the spirit, thumos, as well as the mind and the wits in connection with the full range of psychological and mental activities that would later be observed by the psyche. So while Homer is, of course, 
able to treat human beings in all their richness and complexity, he nowhere says that the activities of our heart, spirit, wits, and mind belong to the psyche, and as we saw, he denies wits and mind to the psyche in Hades. To discuss explicitly whether there's any level other than the human being, Achilles or whoever, at which one thing is the subject of all this, is no part of his brief as a poet. To sum up, Homer, our earliest source, composing around 700 BC, clearly subscribes to the core idea, shared by everyone in the ancient tradition, that the psyche makes the difference between life and death. While the Homeric psyche survives in the House of Hades, according to his basic conception, it's a mere shade, no more than a phantasm. But sometimes we get a glimpse through his text of other conceptions, according to which psyche pick up socially where the living characters left off and receive punishment for misdeeds in this life. What would a bodiless psyche have to be have to be to qualify credibly as a subset as a subject of experience after death and for these vicissitudes to be rewards or tortures for us an extreme answer to this question is due to the sixth century philosopher and mystic pythagoras okay pythagoras is famous for many things um, but our present concern is his florid doctrine of metempsychosis according to this our psyche is temporarily housed in a body, but capable of independent existence, so that after departing from our present body, it can come back to be reincarnated, or eventually a special reward if it's managed to purify itself through the cultivation of virtue and wisdom, it can be released from the cycle and live on in discarnate form. Since the idea is meant to be that this whole career is ours, the psyche must not just go on after our death, but be plausibly identified with ourselves. For Pythagoras, then, the postmortem career of a person's psyche was to be seen as the continuation of the same person. Since an insubstantial simulacrum of the body was not suited to that role, the psyche had to be bulked up with at least some of the capacities and attributes of the living self. Indeed, an interesting question arises here about whether the soul should, for this purpose, have all our intellectual and psychological traits and capacities, or if a subset will do, what that should be. But Pythagoras seems to have gone to an extreme. In the famous story that everyone quotes, he begs someone to stop beating a puppy, saying, for it's the soul of a friend which I recognized when I heard its voice. <laughs> <laughs> the dog story indicates that the Pythagorean soul is supposed to be at once personal, able to go on after one life to another body, even of a radically different species, the subject of the pain and the possessor of a still recognizable voice. Diogenes Laertius records that Pythagoras claimed himself to have memory of his former lives, but this is presented as the result of a special request, and so, I guess, is not part of the mechanism that guarantees identity. Note that on this picture, our present life is an opportunity for purification, which may be rewarded by the souls being freed from further incarnation. So at least some of the Pythagorean soul's characteristic activities are done during this life, while in its most pure form, it's independent of embodiment. Unlike the Homeric shade, the Pythagorean soul is in a happy and blessed state when it manages to get free of the body. One final point to be clear on is that the basic notion of the psyche does not dictate whether the entity in question, in fact, is material. For remember that the core notion of the psyche was what makes the difference between something living and something dead, and this is a functional role, leaving open exactly what sort of thing plays the role. In general, the pre-Socratics tended to identify some physical thing as psyche, the pre-Socratic natural philosophers, that is. One candidate, which may well pick up on the notion still preserved in an idiom like he breathed his last, was air, the choice of Anaximenes and Diogenes and Apollonia. Again, the choice of fire, Heraclitus, may draft on the association represented in the phrase cold as the grave. Heraclitus also gives the psyche a crucial intellectual role, and very much later in Hellenistic times, the Stoics will also make the soul both crucially what thinks and also something material. Stoic pneuma is particularly fine but physical for all that. Okay, um, now a little bit on ordinary usage. Even before Pythagoras, the lyric poets had invoked the psyche in connection with emotions. But after Pythagoras, the range um, in which all sorts of authors writing on all sorts of topics invoke the psyche broadens 
hugely. After Pythagoras, we find an extremely wide range of contexts concerning character now, concerning thought, as well as emotion, in which authors who are not developing a special theory of the psyche mention it. And um, in general, I hate it when people have stuff on the handouts that then they don't read, so I don't know when you're supposed to have time to read it, but I put some of these in case you want to uh, glance at them at some point. Um, uh, in, but just to summarize now, in general, not just desires, but love, grief, joy, and anger have become the province of the psyche. Um, people talk about the psyche in connection with courage. Um, also, importantly, psyche can be straightforwardly invoked in connection with what we would call practical reasoning. And just to wind up by reading one of the quotes, Antiphon in a law court speech relies on both the what is lost at death and the deliberator roles when he says, take away from the accused the psyche that planned the crime. Thus, by the fifth century, it was standard to speak of the psyche not just as what we lose in death, but as the real subject of our actions and passions while we're alive, of our emotions, plans, moral characteristics, and thoughts. In other words, the psyche is ordinarily spoken of had added to its core what is lost at death role and taken on the whole range of states, activities, and receptivities that we consider psychological. On the subject of its immortality, there was no general agreement within the culture. The strand of thinking that had originated even well, long back in the mystic past, the strand of thinking originating in Orphism and mystery religion seems to presuppose the immortality of the soul. How else could punishment after death be possible, or a better afterlife through initiation in mysteries make any sense? Um, so the popularity of the mystery seems to indicate that people did have emotional engagement with the possibility of their soul's survival. It is also clear that people did not suppose this to have been established definitively. Though Socrates in the Apology treats it as an open question whether we survive death, Similarly, Cephalus in the Republic, who of course is no specialist theoretician but an ordinary guy, Cephalus in the Republic reports that when we get old, we become fearful lest tales about reward and punishment in Hades, which we had previously been confident enough to ignore, might be true after all. Sebes in the Phaedo gives us a window into everyday thinking when he says to Socrates, everything else you said is excellent, I think, but men find it very hard to believe what you said about the soul. They think that after it's left the body, it no longer exists anywhere, but that it's destroyed and dissolved on the very day the man dies, as soon as it leaves the body, and that on leaving it, it's dispersed like breath of smoke, has flown away and gone, and is no longer anything anywhere. Since Sebes, who says this, has himself studied with the Pythagorean Philolaeus, this seems to indicate that far from that sect having convinced everyone else of the soul's immortality, the influence on that point was the other way around. Ordinary people's doubts undermine the confidence even of card-carrying Pythagoreans. The background of the characters of the Phaedo makes Plato's point that the Pythagoreans have not established the interesting theses of the soul's character and immortality adequately. And perhaps the reference to smoke also takes a swipe at Homer, for he claimed that the psyche is like smoke, but then what keeps it together? In fact, the Homeric notion that the body, not the psyche, is what matters still has some purchase. At the deathbed of Socrates, Crito asks his childhood friend how they should bury him, earning a long and darkly humorous rebuke from the philosopher for having missed the whole point of the discussion of the Phaedo, according to which our real self is our immortal soul, which goes on to better things, leaving behind the unimportant corpse. So putting all this together, the picture we get is that by Plato's time, the issue of the immortality of the soul was in a similar position to the one it occupies today. Some dedicated religionists had a doctrine about it, Everyone was familiar with tales about rewards and punishments after death, but most did not believe definitely in immortality. It's, of course, open to our contemporaries simply to give up belief in the soul and to stop talking about it. But the situation was other in Plato's day. One could hardly deny the existence of the psyche when its core function was to make the difference between things that were alive and those that were not. And since the ordinary person also spoke uncritically of the soul as having all our emotional, moral, and intellectual traits and capacities, there would be significant cost to giving up the notion entirely. We've seen that Pythagoras had not managed to provide adequate justification for his doctrines on the soul, 
which pioneered the expansion of the cell's capacities in connection with the doctrine of metempsychosis. Yet if the way the ordinary person in the 5th and 4th centuries spoke didn't have backing from these Pythagorean doctrines, then it had none at all. Okay, so now we come to Plato's project. Socrates in the Apology summed up his engagement with his fellow citizens, which of course in the book has already been described in an earlier chapter, Socrates summed up his engagement as essentially trying to get them to care for their souls, for wisdom and truth, rather than possessions, schremata, or honor. We've seen from our study of ordinary usage that this formulation would have seemed intelligible to an audience of randomly selected Athenians, such as to constitute a jury. Yet, in view of the higgledy-piggledy character of the development of our notion, a host of questions concerning the Tuche did need attention. Plato will, in the Phaedo and in the Republic, do much to develop the theme of philosophy as the care of the soul, which is immortal, immaterial, and our real self, having all the psychological capacities, and most essentially of all, reason. In securing such functions as planning and desiring to the soul, Plato was in effect seeing what philosophy could do to secure what had become the ordinary Greek notion of the agent. To do this, one would have to show that the soul has the psychological capacities associated with the real person and was not merely a Homeric shade. Since Pythagorean immortality was the historical bridge over which the capacities of the person originally went to the soul, to recapitulate philosophically the historical development of the notion, one would prove immortality and also demonstrate the soul's possession of the capacities of the person. The Phaedo's well-known setting on the occasion of the death of Socrates, of course, points up the personal interest of its theme. We're all vitally interested in knowing our prospects and those of our friends when this life comes to an end. But this dialogue is not only linked to the apology by the circumstance that it shows the carrying out of the sentence that was the outcome of the trial depicted earlier. While the apology is Plato's effort to compose a defense of Socrates appropriate to the context of court and the actual charges against the historical man, the main conversation of our present dialogue is also presented as introduced by a need for Socrates to defend himself now to a more sympathetic circle. While the charge is the joking one that he's not unhappy enough to be leaving the gods that oversee his present incarnation and his circle of friends, his response amplifies the point, which we saw was present briefly in the Apology as well, about philosophical activity as care of the soul. Here, he doesn't just operate with the apology notions of the soul, wisdom, and truth, but with Pythagoreans among his circle, he throws in the Pythagorean notions of purification, initiation, preparation for death, which is the soul's release from bondage. In this introductory discussion, Socrates simply gets the interlocutor to agree all of, to all of his claims, and he doesn't justify any of them. So maybe here he's acting sort of uh, like what they're familiar with from their Pythagorean circles. But this theme uh, will come to a climax when it returns much later in the dialogue, when it will have received support, and so I'll postpone discussion until then. For now, we should note that Socrates' defense is that our best hope of attaining wisdom is when our souls get away from the distractions and distortions now forced on them by embodiment. Then Siebes rightly observes that this hope can only be realized if our souls survive our present life and have wisdom, so leading into the main body of the discussion. So now um, I've organized the next bit uh, just to go through taking each of the main arguments in turn. Um, so the first is the cyclical argument. This functions by saying that there's a pattern for changes. What becomes larger must formally have been smaller and vice versa. What goes to sleep must formally have been awake and vice versa. Not only that, but in such cases there are pairs of processes that link the opposites, as for example growing and diminishing in the first case and falling asleep and waking up in the second. Then we see that being alive and being dead suit the general schema so that we should also link them by a pair of processes. Accordingly, what is dead becomes so from having been alive and vice versa, and coming to life must always follow dying unless life on earth is to be exhausted. Okay, I'm skipping some comparison with um, Aristotle's schema of change in the physics and a little complication that that reveals about how this cyclical argument should be formulated, but I'll just now let us sum up what Plato achieves in the argument. 
he introduces the prototype of what will become Aristotle's model of change in order to support the Orphic Pythagorean picture, that ancient story that was mentioned at the beginning of the discussion, of the soul cycling between incarnate and discarnate forms, or loosely speaking, between life and death. Important though this way of thinking of change became for Aristotle, through whom it's percolated down to feel like common sense, um, the particular application to proving the soul's persistence through an endless cycle is open to criticism, which I leave now as an exercise for anyone who wants to do it. What I'd like to draw attention to, though, is that as we saw earlier, the mere continuing existence of some psyche after life here is not necessarily our survival, nor is it necessarily a happy outcome. The persistence of the Homeric psyche satisfied no one, least of all themselves. <coughs> Thus, while the cyclical argument offers philosophical support to one part of Pythagorean and Orphic doctrine, the pattern of return, that's merely one component among what was needed. This is why, historically, the Pythagoreans added capacities to the basic Homeric shade, and that, I propose, is what Plato starts to do in his philosophical recapitulation of the process when he follows the cyclical argument with the argument from recollection. Okay, so the key points in recollection argument for our purposes are these. As soon as we're born, we have the ability to construe sensible equal things like sticks and stones as equal, but as falling short of equality itself. And I take that just to mean that we see them as displaying equality, but we don't take them to be identical with equality. Um, similarly, we have the capacity to experience things that are greater, that are smaller, that are beautiful, that are just, that are good, that are pious. This phenomenon requires our being able to operate with the notions of equality, beauty, and the other properties. But since we can exercise this ability as soon as we're born, our knowledge of equality, beauty, and so on cannot be acquired in this life. So our souls do not acquire this knowledge once we're human beings, but must have existed before and already had wisdom. To deal with the circumstance that we don't have conscious awareness of full account-giving knowledge of all fundamental realities from birth, the theory is that at birth our knowledge was forgotten, so that what we call learning in this life is the piecemeal recollection of our latent wisdom. Then the circumstance that recollection can initially be partial will be available to explain why most of us have not recollected most forms enough to pass the Socratic test by giving accounts of them. We can now notice and solve what's a real puzzle about this argument, if read a historically. For the interlocutors actually point out that the argument only establishes that the soul, well, if this establishes anything, but it, even if it worked, it would only establish that the soul pre-exists our life, not that it survives it. And Socrates replies imperturbably, it's been proved even now, if you're ready to combine this argument with the one we agreed on before, that was the cyclical argument. So here's the puzzle. If we have to appeal to the cyclical argument for the recollection argument to reach its goal, then why offer the recollection argument at all? Clearly, if the only agenda were to prove the soul's immortality, the recollection argument would not advance us. But in the context of the concerns we've been considering, we can see it as adding something very much to the point. The cyclical argument establishes the death and return pattern of what might be no more than a homeric shade, or for that matter, some physical engine of living creatures, say fire. The argument from recollection starts the project of adding capacities to the soul, capacities that are needed if it's to live up to the Pythagorean desiderata and the 5th and 4th century assumptions that is the subject of our intellectual and moral activity, and indeed, that we can pretty much identify ourselves with it. For after all, what the argument from recollection establishes is not just the existence of the soul prior to our present life, what it urges us to accept is the attribution to the pre-existing soul of knowledge of fundamental realities. Indeed, most of the passage is spent discussing what recollection is, what kind of knowledge we have, and how and when we could have gotten it. That is, the passage discusses our cognitive vicissitudes and the corresponding activities of our soul. Socrates' conclusion, so then, our souls also existed apart from the body before they took on human form, and they had intelligence, or phronesis, which we could also translate, and they had wisdom. Answers to the challenge at the start of the whole, his conclusion so formulated, answers to the challenge at the start of the whole immortality discussion that he show that the soul still exists after a man has died and that it still possesses some capability and phronesis, intelligence or wisdom. 
Also in this stretch of conversation, Socrates legitimates the assumption of our identity with the soul through the connection between our acquisition of knowledge and an achievement that can only belong to the soul. To see this, note that in the body of the passage, Socrates speaks for pages in terms of what we do and cannot do with plural masculine and first person plural forms. So after the point that we have the ability as soon as we're born to see perceptible equals as falling short of equality, he says that we must have acquired knowledge of the equal before this. Again, a tiny bit later, he says, but I think if we acquire this knowledge before birth, then lost it at birth, and then later by the use of our senses in connection with those objects we mentioned, we recovered the knowledge we had before, would not what we call learning be the recovery of our own knowledge, and we're right to call this recollection. But how, one may wonder, could we do anything before our birth? Only if we can identify ourselves with something that existed before that. And note, in fact, that um, right after this, I didn't put this on your hand, right after this, um, Socrates speaks in terms of our souls, psychi, feminine plural now, saying, when did our souls acquire knowledge? And then draws the conclusion about their prenatal existence and wisdom. So this passage is making great strides in the picture of the soul. It gives us reasons to think that the psyche is responsible for a key element in our cognitive lives. And since the soul has emerged as the real possessor of knowledge we must recollect and use in this life, it's plausibly identified with ourselves. Okay, on to the affinity argument. By not formalizing every argument and worrying about its validity and soundness, we get to move through them more quickly. Um, <laughs> The affinity argument contains, um, oh, ar goes to the conclusion that the soul is immortal or nearly so, and then is followed by the reintroduction of some of the traditional Homeric and Pythagorean notions and a specifically Platonic interpretation of them. So um, I'll look at each of those parts of the discussion in turn. The argument takes its cue from the way that at death, the soul might be dispersed. That was the quotation that I read way at the beginning. What if at death the soul is dispersed like smoke? He considers what kind of thing is liable to dispersal and actually makes use of a scheme that Plato inherits from the preceding generation of natural scientists. For now, we need only note that all their cosmologies, including atomism, with a descendant of which we're still familiar, propose to explain the ordinary world of birth and death, variety and change that we see around us in terms of fundamental entities that are immune to generation and destruction. So something like a tulip is really a composite. There is, for Leucippus and Democritus, a temporary collocation of atoms that form it, and this perhaps undergoes various substitutions over time until the complex is ultimately dispersed when ordinary people register the tulip as dead. It's essential to this type of scheme that the derived entities are made up out of the fundamental ones, which are themselves ungenerated and indestructible and eternally what they are. In this type of theory, the derived entities are the ordinary things we see, smell, and handle, while the fundamental entities need not and typically do not appear to perception, but are things we have access to with the mind. We posit them in the course of understanding the derived entities. Different theories result from different choices of the fundamental entities. But without going into the details of different theories now, we can already appreciate that this basic schema for making sense of our world provides the two clusters of properties with which the affinity argument will work. One cluster is things that are incomposite, indissoluble, invisible. Those are the fundamental realities, which in Plato's theory are the objects of definition, such things as equality, beauty, um, and so on. The second cluster, the derived entities, is changeable, dissoluble, visible, the objects of the world around us. So now there are three zippy considerations, each one of which is supposed to show an affinity of the soul with the first cluster, the fundamental entities, and of the body with the second. First consideration, the soul actually is invisible while the body is visible. Second, the soul's optimal investigation is not done through the body and senses, but it has access by itself to the realm of stable and eternal reality. And finally, the soul rules a role that's more divine while the body serves and takes a role that's mortal. Um, and now the conclusion from all of this is soberly um, put, since the soul has more affinity 
more kinship and likeness to the first cluster, it is the sort of thing to be immortal or nearly so. So like recollection, this argument does not pretend to go all the way to immortality. But it does lead to development of some of the notions we've been operating with. For now, courtesy of the word invisible, i.e. day, which has figured prominently in the first cluster, right? The fundamental entities are not accessible to sight. Plato gives a new interpretation to the traditional language of Hades. And at least I gather from LSJ that it's still credible that Hades could be formed from Alpha Primitive any day and somehow. So that the idea of the unseen somehow um, may not be as fanciful as some of Plato's etymologies. But anyway, so he says the invisible, um, the, real, the real Hades is this realm of the invisible. As always, Hades is where the psyche goes without the body, no longer to be seen by the living. But instead of this realm of the unseen being populated by miserable shades that are insubstantial likenesses of bodies, the occupants of the true Hades are now the fundamental realities accessible to thought and the souls that are akin to them. So the old underworld has been replaced by the domain of beauty, equality, justice, and so on, or to put it fancifully, the traditional dank house of Hades has been transformed into platonic heaven. <laughs> Consonant with this is Plato's interpretation of the Pythagorean recommendation to purification from the bodily as a precondition for bliss. All that language of pure, all that language that I postponed talking about when he used it in the defense, all the language of purification versus infection by the bodily, mysteries, wisdom, happiness, freedom from bondage that Socrates used at the beginning of the discussion in his defense passage now returns to make the core claim that the soul, if it manages to get free from the body, will return at death to its own natural realm, realm will exercise its capacities on appropriate objects and so be happy, while if it's polluted with the body, this will be frustrated. But the present passage develops two different ways of thinking of this. First, we have, I presume as a joke, the literal interpretation that association with the body and adoption of its tastes physically weighs down the soul so that it hangs around graveyards, as people say, hence the sighting of phantasms there. And notice that these are described with the language of Adeline phantasmata, the very terminology that suggests Homeric psychi. These misguided souls eventually get their wish and are reincarnated, depending on their detailed tastes and values, perhaps as donkeys, if they were over fond of food, drink, and sex, or wolves and hawks, aggressive types, or if they're social and civic but without philosophy, perhaps as bees or wasps or ants, or moderate human beings. <laughs> But lest we be put off by the idea of the soul as being physically weighed down, this is immediately followed by the discussion of what lovers of learning say to themselves, a more sophisticated interpretation of the same notions, or so to speak, a way of translating the traditional language into a platonic. We now learn clearly that the detrimental effect of the soul's excessive trafficking with the physical is not that it's physically weighed down, but is cognitive. There's the obvious circumstance that the needs of the body for food, rest, recovery from illness, and so on, prevent us from seeking wisdom all the time, and much more so if we become involved in the quest for possessions and honor beyond what's necessary, and so are led into wars, and so on. This is the familiar contrast between interest in possessions, or hiremata, and the soul. But more insidiously and fundamentally, even in this, what really binds the soul most to the body and militates against its purification is that the soul of every man, when it feels violent pleasure or pain in connection with some object, inevitably believes at the same time that what causes such feelings must be very clear and very true, which it is not. That was a quote. The disastrous consequence of this is that the soul believes the truth is what the body says it is. In other words, it's thinking like the body that imprisons the soul. Now let's draw together and interpret the pervasive remarks that for purposes of attaining wisdom and truth, reliance on the senses is disastrous. First, we should articulate in order to bracket a reading of this claim that's natural for us, yet inappropriate to our text. Plato is not <coughs> claiming that we can never be correct when we taste that something is sweet or see that it's equal or beautiful, which would be the force of the claim, perhaps, when read with our notion of truth. Rather, and this will be the topic of a subsequent chapter, but rather, um, truth, to aletheas or aletheia, just like being reality and substance, to on or the zia, 
is being used here in an elevated or honorific way, truth and being in this pet usage of Plato's designate what is fundamental. The affinity argument just showed us that at the schematic level, Plato supposes that what's real and true in this sense, what's fundamental, basic entities, what's real and true in this sense is accessed by reason. As we ourselves probably think, you can see and touch gold, but when it comes to identifying what gold is, you have to use your mind. Similarly, we handle triangular pastry and jewelry, but for what it is to be a triangle, we turn to geometry. Our dialogue develops a special use of the words logistis thy and logismos for this type of basic theorizing. It's not any old reckoning or doing accounts, but what the soul is capable of when it's going beyond sensation and coming to grips in its own proprietary way with true being, the fundamental entities that lie behind and are explanatory of the varied phenomena we see around us. And to think back a little farther in the dialogue, the recollection argument too gave us grants for the claim that we reach such things as beauty and equality with the soul itself and not with the senses. But we saw Plato developing the point there that far from deriving our understanding of equality, sorry, our understanding of equality, beauty, and so on from our sense experience, it's the other way around. In order to have sense experience, one must already be able to operate with such notions as equality and beauty themselves. Now that we have a translation into Platonic of the claim that the philosopher purifies the soul from the bodily in order to reach wisdom, we can understand how the claim that the philosopher will be truly virtuous is connected with this, simply because his value system is so transformed that he won't care about the pleasures that motivate vice. The final myth of the pure regions with gemstones and so on far more beautiful than the corrupted objects of our realm tells of the blessed soul's journey after this life in a literary representation of the points established in the discussion. With the understanding of the soul and its capacities the dialogue has offered so far, we can also see how the tranquility Socrates will show as he faces the separation of his soul from his body is supposed to be grounded, except for the niggling fact that the immortality which would make him secure of his soul's continuing in better circumstances is still not well established. Only the cyclical argument was even presented as having that conclusion. Um, as we have seen, recollection at most showed that the soul pre-exists this life um, and affinity that it's longer lived than the body. But with everything else in the development of the defense themes in place, if only immortality was short up, we can appreciate the role of the coping stone of the dialogue conventionally called the final argument. The final argument is the subject of an extensive and vexed secondary literature in which scholars typically go well beyond the formulations, even in the lengthy passage. But I'll try, um, instead of importing a huge complex machinery of my own, I'll try to use phrases that parallel the formulations in the text, arranged so as to make what I hope is a fairly idiomatic and plausible progression of thought. My purpose in this is to mimic for ourselves the impact of this passage on its actual audience. They did not have access to the mammoth collection of journal articles and books that deal with Plato's so-called theory of forms. It's at least clear that our passage trades on the identification of a simple pattern and a more elaborate one. The overall strategy is to mention a broad range of cases where the patterns obtain using the simple to help us get to the elaborate. Then we'll be invited to apply the elaborate pattern to the case of the soul. The simple pattern concerns opposites in a straightforward way. Cold makes things cold. Cold itself can never be hot. Heat makes things hot. Heat itself can never be cold. Beauty makes things beautiful. Beauty itself can never be ugly. This pattern governs not only the opposites themselves, or as they're also styled, the opposites in nature, but also the opposites in us. Thus, not only can the wet itself never be dry, but neither can the wetness in my risotto. Alas, this does not mean the risotto cannot be dried out. <laughs> what we can say is that if that happens, the wetness in the dish must either go elsewhere, perhaps the steam, or be destroyed. Now there's a more elaborate pattern we can also notice. Snow, while not identical with cold, has a special relation to it. In fact, snow is cold and makes things both snowy and cold. Snow itself can never be hot. Other examples in our dialogue feature the number three and its relation to odd and even, and fever as a bringer on of sickness, which one then presumes can never admit health. 
The general idea is that some things are so associated with one of a pair of opposites that they cannot accept the other member of the pair. Now, the traditional notion of the soul as what accounts for life will make it lie near to suppose that this case fits our bringer on of an opposite scheme. So it will follow that the soul cannot admit death. Snow, the bringer on of cold, can never be hot. So at the approach of heat, any particular portion of snow, say the snow in some rustic dessert, must either withdraw or perish, go into the freezer, or else melt. Similarly, soul, the bringer on of life, cannot undergo death. At the approach of death, the soul in one of us must either withdraw or perish. But on reflection, in this special case, the option of perishing is held to make no sense. For something alive to undergo perishing would be to admit death, which has already been ruled out for the soul. So when death approaches the living creature, the deathless and indestructible soul must withdraw safe, or to put it in the traditional terms, it must depart for Hades and exist there. OK, now concluding remarks. Of course, once we've got the sweep of our dialogue's arguments, we should also realize that the exact interpretation of some of their initially plausible sounding starting points requires further work. The very great variation in what professional scholars produce when they try to precisify and formalize them may well result from the fact that the text underdetermines the official theory of forms. Rather, by using plausible formulations that suggest a way to get to an interesting bottom line, Plato has motivated us to do the difficult work developing such a theory will require. Socrates summed up after the argument from recollection by saying, if those realities we're always talking about exist, the beautiful and the good and all that kind of reality, and we refer all the things we perceive to that reality, discovering that existed before and is ours, and we compare these things with it, then, just as they exist, so our soul must exist before we're born. If these realities do not exist, then this argument is altogether futile. And similarly, he says after the final argument, our first hypotheses require clearer examination, even though we find them convincing. And if you analyze them adequately, you will, I think, follow the argument as far as a man can. So one very important part of Plato's compositional strategy in the Phaedo is to draw us into further reflection on his theory of forms, to which, of course, in the book, I hope people will uh, read about in a subsequent chapter. As far as the soul goes, we found in our dialogue an exploration of a variety of ways to use reasonable sounding considerations to support key claims about it. The dialogue, starting from the basic idea of the psyche as what is lost at death, parallels the Pythagorean pattern, but rebuilds philosophically the soul as a deathless, immaterial subject, and undertakes to show by argument that this subject is our real self, characterized by intelligence and wisdom, and happy when able to pursue those on its own. Yet while bulked up relative to the Homeric shade, the soul of the Phaedo is stripped down relative to its Pythagorean forerunner. From our point of view, this can only be an improvement. There was obviously something laughable in the story of the recognizable voice coming from the dog. Um, but how far should the soul be stripped down? We've seen that the ordinary person in Plato's day, no less than now, believed that the same thing that has understanding and wisdom also longs for food and love and desires achievement and the respect it commands from others. Yet none of this is properly the concern of the soul by the lights of the Phaedo. These were pollutions from the thinking of the body. In the Republic, Plato will take up the questions of how to think of our souls and how to think of ourselves <coughs> if our souls during this life really do naturally have the full range of psychological capacities um, or the full range of capacities that we talk about as psychological. So overall, Plato's immortality arguments and his psychological investigation work together to make up a program well suited to his cultural context. I've tried to reorient perceptions so that we need not continue to regard the immortality proofs as misguided attempts to make a philosophical silk purse out of a sow's ear. Rather, Finding that his contemporary society had an insecurely stitched pigskin wallet in daily use, <laughs> Plato experimented rather interestingly with various ways in which philosophy might help to reinforce some of its themes. Thank you. <laughs> My the comments that I'm going to make pertain to the archaic section of the oh, right. until the because I have worked on the 
idea. So I wanted to throw this on. So what I have come up with is that Homer, Homer's idea of CP contains immortality. Of that thing, the psyche itself. Of that, of that thing, the psyche itself, exactly. So these things exist, they will exist forever. They, they go to the other side of the ocean, which is the dark Hades. What they're missing is memory. So that's why they're not individuals, because there's no memory. And none of these souls psyche, recognize Odysseus unless they drink blood. I know scholars have divided opinions about this, but I've checked the passages, and if they haven't drunk blood, they don't recognize it, with the only exception of Tiresias, who is this exceptional wizard, and so he has memory. Now, there's another passage at the end, which you alluded to. But Ajax and so on, remember, isn't it true? He doesn't specifically keep mentioning the blood, right? That's why Hoybeck says, because you cannot show the famous suicide thirsting for life, right? But then the whole cluster that Ajax is part of, because Ajax can't drink the blood, I thought he doesn't mention anyone drinking blood after that point, right? He, you know what happens is that he mentions the blood, and then you've got a string of heroes, and, and the blood is taken for granted. So Agamemnon comes and Ajax comes. But they have all, it's presupposed that they drop the blood. Well, that's one way of reading it or some or the other. But then what about those people? Then there's the right. torture of this Tantalus and so on. Right. Okay. Then there's at the end, and I know Mary Beth has something to well, say. Well, it's about what you're saying, so I'm yes. okay. Please go on. Uh, okay. And then what happens at the final book of the Odyssey is that the dead talk among themselves. And you know, they recognize each other and exchange stories. But who can verify what the dead say to each other? So it's a different, completely different situation. But to wrap this thing up with memory, uh, the reason I got the idea is because we have these gold tablets from the 6th century to 5th century, which say, they tell the dead, if you go to the underworld, don't drink from the waters of destruction, of um, forgetfulness. Mm -hmm. So the instruction, Lifi, the instruction is don't drink from these waters. In other words, the intention was to preserve memory, but because that was the danger, that you lose the memory. So basically, I mean, this is so, yeah. one thing I'm very unsure about is whether I you know, should try to say less or should try to say more, since I myself can only do a very limited amount on this prehistory. But still, I think saying something about it does add interesting context. But it sounds as if you basically almost prefer my original version, which was just um, the psychi go to Hades, persist there indefinitely. Right. But because of their lack of noas and frenos, oh, right, first of all, they're not the, they're certainly not the original guys. They're and they're miserable. Exactly. Right. So it's because like, Altus, you do agree with that, right? The contrast, right? Paul Estif, the most fichas, I did perhaps in here, own Altus da. Hello, Altus. Did you agree with that basic idea that yes, if anything, yes. it's the body, yes. the corpse yes. is the original guy, and this Adelon yes. is not? Memory makes you an individual because then you would go to Heraclitus, that there is this immortal substance in the universe, call it an atom, call it a transformation. But without memory, you're not an individual. So what good is immortality if you if you don't remember who you are and what you've done? So, but you show in your paper, I think you show the development to that, that Plato does something different, and I think that's the important thing. So, and also picking up, but do you also agree with that part of the prehistory that in a certain way, mm -hmm. Plato is doing a less crazy version exactly. of the Pythagorean strategy? But what about this part? The other thing I kind of like is the thought that, because otherwise, I mean, Pythagoreanism seems so bizarre that merely doing a slightly less crazy version of it is inherently not that attractive. So I also like the idea, though, that if it was this this huge expansion in ordinary use of these um, capacities seems, if it had any grounding, to have been grounded in the fact that Pythagoras gave all those capacities in his case, motivated only by this crazy metempsychosis. But then that also, to me, that added to the interest of why you'd want to shore up, experiment with shoring up the Pythagorean picture, because in fact, um, ordinary people, while rejecting immortality, 
we're buying into all of those capacities that, that Pythagoras, with his personal immortality, not just of the psyche, but of the psyche considered as me, right. added to. Exactly. Right. So you kind of, your detailed thing on Homer is a little different, but your overall picture is sympathetic. Yeah, oh yes, definitely. And, and the development from Pythagoras and so Pythagoras changed something because he thinks that memory is additive and you retain some of it and so on, apparently. But in his but case, he, since he, you know, again, claims to have had memories of his past lives, but since I thought he presented that as something that he only got through a special request, and he doesn't seem to say then that everyone has memories of their past lives. So I was thinking that when he was thinking that you are reincarnated in these other creatures and so on, what makes them you is not that they remember your previous life. Well, that's very debatable since we have nothing of right. Pythagoras, and I want to let other people talk. And that's one okay. I, that's one reason again I didn't want to go into it too much. But but this is all part of what's what's mystical about Pythagoras and why I was therefore thinking this this notion could use some attention, right? That he sort of posits, let's say, that the same thing is cycling or even getting discarnate. But not only do we not have anything, but uh, it, Going by Plato, there was never very much that was adequate. Okay, sorry. I just yeah. have, this is yeah. not even a question. It's yeah. kind of embarrassing. It's just I have no memory, and therefore I'm not an individual. Because I didn't <laughs> run the Odyssey in so long. But when Odysseus encounters his mother yeah. in Hades, it's so sad. Right. So is it only sad from his point of view? I could. What is? What exactly are her capacities? You explain this. So I'm sort of asking you to repeat. Well, so as you uh, explain. And what does she not recognize him? See, I didn't remember that. Well, no, this is the thing. So first what happens is, is yeah. you know, there's all that rigmarole that Cersei tells him about having to do the sacrifice right. and all the right? So a bunch of them are drawn to this, and she's one, and he sees her, and I think he can't understand why she doesn't come up to him, right? right? But in any case, he has to stick with the plan, where which is to interview Tiresias, so he does that. After he accomplished the mission, then he's free really socially, right? And so he he then uses this strategy of using his sword to ward off from the blood everyone except who he's willing to recover, to talk to, right? So I think he lets her go first, right? She and wants to drink blood, otherwise she doesn't recognize right. him. So the thought is... Keep the right. away. So it seems like the idea is because blood is some kind of life liquid, right? right. Um, so she drinks the blood, then she recognizes him, gets back her memories, so he asks how everyone is at home, because of course even though she's dead, he's been away for 20 years, right? right. So she tells him how people are doing up to when she was alive, and how she died, and how his father um, is still there. But, you know, he tries to grasp He tries to embrace her, but because she's merely a, a, a phantasm, Right. It doesn't work. And then I think she actually also explains to him, because he still hasn't quite fully internalized the thing that Nano was talking about, even though Cersei told him before. And so she also explains to him, oh no, because he actually says to her, what, you know, are you not my real mother? Are you just a trick that Persephone said? And, um, and she says, no, it's not a trick. Right, but we are merely Adela, right? We're just likenesses or phantasms or race, whatever you want to call them, right? And we only recover memory by. But it's not an option for them, it's only under this extraordinary right. circumstance. Okay. Right. Yeah. So under normal under normal circumstances. At least that's what I was thinking was the normal conception, but yours is a little different. I was thinking under normal circumstances, um, they they can't do anything interesting. And I was thinking that that was the underlying explanation for why Achilles then says, right? Uh, I, um, you know, Odysseus says to the shade of Achilles, trying to compliment him, you know, here, just as you were glorious on earth, now, you know, you're the king of the shades or something, and Achilles says, it's so miserable here, right? I would rather be the servant of a man with no land than king over all the day, right? And so on, somehow it's thought that all this, but yeah. But even even for you, what they can do is very unsatisfying, oh, even yes. to themselves, yes. right? Yes. And also leaves them short of being the original gods. Yes. Without memory, you're nothing. You could see nine people. And 
Alzheimer's, you know? They lose who they are. And actually, this is, um, again, we, are, we, we should try to broaden the discussion, but just to say one more thing, because this sort of leads into a comparison with Plato, right? That um, in a certain way, Plato is trying, right, to endow the soul with enough so that it will be credible as yourself and be credible as having an enjoyable life. But it's also possible that this is really a life that you have to be someone like Socrates to embrace precisely because it's apparently only this kind of logos mos, this theoretical understanding of justice, the beautiful and the good, and not what you are talking about, memory of my personal life. So it's not actually going to be an immortalization of your personality quirks. And this actually is why, according to me, and I'm glad that you um, and John are here who went to my talk on the symposium, the symposium and the Phaedo work together, right? That what's literally immortal for Plato is something that enjoys an existence that doesn't preserve your personal quirks. And so the way you can preserve your personal idiosyncrasies is by that Homeric route of leaving behind something of yourself, except that Plato then has his version of it, right? So you should leave behind not just a deed of valor or a poem about it, but you know, a law code, a theorem, again, under you should or achieve mystical union with the beautiful itself. So there's the idea that that kind of thing is of course going to be more personal, but it won't be literal immortality. Then complementing it, you have literal immortality, but without those elements that you were talking about. Did I know I forget did you did I No you didn't. Okay. What, what, oh what it was about it declare. Yeah, right? I didn't want it was still <laughs> Right. So she says to him, right, I'm right, it's yeah. not a trick, but I, what I am here mm -hmm. is an Adelon, an apparition. Right, right. I guess, well, that was the other thing where I was thinking it's plausible they have no capacities, right? Because what do you expect, right? As if he says, you know, it's like smoke, it's like a shadow, it's just the insubstantial apparition of a person, why would it have any? Of course it has no capacities, right? It not only can't do deeds of valor, but it shouldn't be able to think either. Mm -hmm. So it's like right. mourning, it's her and not her. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that, the whole Adolon idea, it's connected with being and not being, and right, it's just a resemblance, it's not the original thing. Yeah, okay, sorry, John. I, I think the, thing, the, 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 the danger here is to uh, try to expect too much of these poets. Mm -hmm. They're not Dante. Right. Dante had a religious theory to to, to sell. Homer does too. Well, uh, I declare. <laughs> I mean, Virgil and Homer are, are writing poetry, and I don't think they're trying to be consistent. I mean, if you look at Book Twenty Four of the Odyssey, they're perfectly able to ask questions. They're there's, dead. There's no they're blood. They're talking to each other. Right. You know? But this, so you endorse the idea that I took in this that he doesn't care. It's for the purposes right. of the story. I mean, and just as there aren't there are other things in terms of the, not having to do with philosophy, but just the plot, like whether Persephone, uh, sorry, whether Penelope is collaborating with Odysseus in the Revenge on the Suitors, right? That again, I thought there are some bits that some people seem to think are written as if she knows all along that it's him and she's helping him, but in terms of the larger plot, she shouldn't know. And then again, they see, commentators seem perfectly happy to say, but this is a great bit, and he doesn't want to, you know, it's dramatically effective, and he doesn't want to leave it out. And again, it seems like needlessly scholastic or something to say he should reconcile all of these tensions. That's right. right. And he's heard different versions of many versions of the story and takes the, the choice that's in the good things. Mm -hmm. But do you think that he... I think he's a very coherent thinker, and it's thought through, and he was recognized as such. He was called the father of religion. So I don't think there is any inconsistency, but there is a poetic license. And when the dead talk to each other, who can check them? <laughs> it's very different circumstances from when a living person like Odysseus confronts the dead and when they talk to each other mm -hmm. in their own world. Well, that's the, that's the only world that would ever exist uh, other than in the case of the Indian and Dante and, and Homer. The, the living just don't have conversations with the dead. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't happen. <laughs> 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 the other 
I just had a, a question about the argument from from recollection. Oh yeah, I was uh, hoping you'd give me some good references on any well, ideas. <laughs> yeah, that was basically where I was where I was coming from. I mean, just if you think that the argument shows that you couldn't have or that you know, you couldn't recognize things as equal without having some, you know, sort of non-empirically based cognition of equality. All right, so it establishes that, but how do you get through from that to the soul must have pre-existed or something? Because it seems like there are various alternative explanations you might have in terms of, you know, why we have that, that capacity, having innate ideas, for example, or even in the 17th century, uh, people like Malbranche, who would go in for a kind of platonic theory of forms, but, you know, ontologically, put them in God and say we have some you know, capacity to sort of cognitively access the forms. But that this, you know, the fact that you don't have, um, you know, any kind of empirical explanations for certain of our cognitive abilities, you can't get from that to any kind of pre-existence, I think. Mm -hmm. So just, I'm just wondering why right. you move so quickly from, you know, that, uh, you know, ability to recognize things as equal requiring some non-empirically based cognition of equality to the to the pre-existence because it seems like there are these other sorts of mm -hmm. explanations. Well in a way the, the really the too short answer is I agree with you. But you know, <laughs> one one problem with saying anything about the fear, but unfortunately he has to, is it's not as if anybody thinks that any of these actually yeah. works totally, right? So um, so but having said that maybe what in its context makes it a little gives some kind of answer because you say your thought is um, why aren't we just born with this wisdom right so I guess well there's two things one is this thing that it's always harping on that since we're not a, we don't consciously have it right you have to allow time to forget it but you so then you say why aren't we born with this wisdom latent or yeah, you have to have an account of the sense in which you've got it, but you don't have it. Right. But you, you could say, why aren't we born just with a tendency to construe things this way or something like that. Right. Um, but do you think that what makes it a little, um, lie a little nearer in the context is the way it follows the circular argument. So you actually already have this picture that the soul is cycling in and out of bodies. And so you have this thing on the picture that the soul did pre-exist and then come into my present body. And so then when we ask the question, OK, so uh, how did I get this wisdom, this knowledge that I don't acquire in this life, it's a little less of a jump to say, oh, you know, that thing which, which was cycling along and comes into my body, it acquired it because on your thing, it's like, why, why should I, po we haven't even posited the soul as pre-existing, right? So now, so I was thinking in the context, right? It's already going as pre-existing, but unfortunately has no interesting capacities. And now the need to have this um, wisdom at our disposal becomes a reason for attributing that capacity to that thing. So maybe even though cyclical argument is does that mean I can't say it's superseded by the final argument? No, I guess because, anyway, but whatever parts of the dialogue and cyclical certainly preceded this and final is maybe going to reinforce that, that cause us to think there is a continuing entity, which is the soul. Help, I'm, I was thinking help answer that question. Right, and that's one reason you would go for that sort of an explanation. Right, you have that thing anyway. And then saying, and also I mean, maybe just saying, you know, there's um, there's something very like you or indeed you that pre-existed and got wisdom is a little more obvious as an as an answer to the question, how did you acquire wisdom? Then like, how are you going to tell this? What will what will make it be true that you're born with this with you know with latent knowledge? So what was that last? I mean, I, I was agreeing with okay. that seemed very reasonable as sort of explanation for why he would use that sort of an argument sort of on the curtails or of the 
cyclical, the cyclical argument. Mm -hmm. But we're we offering at the end our criticism of the kind of any any view or not. No, um, I I forgot what I was saying, but forget the part at the end if you like the other part. Um, <laughs> 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 Just remember the part of what I said that was good. Okay. Uh, no. So is this right? In the time of Homer, the soul had to drink something in order to remember anything. But in the time of uh, Plato, the soul needs to drink something in order to forget. Oh. Right? Prior to incarnating. Mm -hmm. well, this seems to me a very uh, 180 degree well, but in a nose thing also involved drinking to forget. Right, it's these tablets. These tablets were both things. Are those were, Orphic? Yeah, they're called, they called so-called Orphic. But anyway, you bought them for probably at a high expense, and they gave you instructions what to do or not to do in the underworld. And so the instructions told you, don't drink from this. You're going to go to this spot, and there's going to be a tree. Go to the left of the tree, and there's going to be a spring. Don't drink from that spring, because you're going to forget everything. So you're very right, and it's forbidding you to drink from this water is forgetful. So it's the opposite. Yeah, that's very interesting. Of course, in yeah. that story, Ur himself is forbidden to drink, right. and that allows it to come back with the with the memory and with the yeah. experience there. Mm -hmm. But the but I, I take the idea to be is that the soul has incredible knowledge, which is it is required to forget temporarily in order to incarnate. Whereas in Homer's uh, time, there, there's, there's nothing. <laughs> it's all embodied, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I guess the other thing, but I understand that you're only talking about their times. One thing that I was trying to suggest that part of what Plato is trying to do is give some interpretation of these traditional stories of these physicalistic things like going somewhere and drinking and being with pure things or not that that doesn't take that literally anymore right that so that in something like the myth at the end of the Phaedo or at the end of the Republic that is an allegory or something of the stuff that was in the body of the dialogue which then will so right the, the, the original um, the original idea of Hades, where you go because you're shade and you're not seen anymore on the earth, is going to be what that really is um, standing for, which is not anymore that physical picture, but the idea of, um, of yeah, of, of you know what what in the Phaedrus is also called gazing on the forms, right? Um, and strangely, I think, you know, even at the end of the whole Narnia series, there's something like that, right? They all, when they all go up to heaven and stuff, and the crotchety old man who was originally the young boy and the magician's nephew keeps saying something like, it's all in Plato. What do they teach these people in schools? <laughs> so, so anyway, but there's the idea that, um, that this kind of, that picture, and again, right, Socrates tells at the end of the Phaedo, presumably because the interlocutors said, right, we're little kids, we're afraid about what will happen, and when you are dead, there won't be anyone to, you know, give us a charm. And so I'm thinking he puts that myth, again, <coughs> as that charm, as that bedtime story, as the Narnia-like thing, but the real thing was supposed to be what was in the, in the body of the book, that that just stands for. What extent, or in what ways does Plato acknowledge the tradition you presented us with and this surrounding interlocutors on this topic? Do you see talk about the Pythagoras? Do you see? Oh, well, the thing is, yes, he does. One thing, and actually David Sedley did a um, uh, paper on this, but partly he's, um, well, it comes in very obviously because Simeas and Sieves, the interlocutors mm -hmm. of the main discussion, have actually spent time with Philolaus, who's the contemporary Pythagorean. And so Socrates says to them stuff like, didn't you hear about this when you were with Philolaus? And they say, oh, well, not being adequate. And so sometimes it's that direct, but at other times, the mere fact David Sedley said is the mere fact that they're so confused. Or like, for example, one thing writes, um, Simeas has a famous objection 
uh, to what Socrates is doing based on the idea that the soul is, is a harmony which is attributed to Philolaus. And so there's some idea like that what, what he has learned from Philolaus about the soul is so confusing that some parts of it are undermining his belief in other parts. Um, or again, right, he, uh, um, I guess it was Seeds, the other one, right, who um, said that thing about the majority of men are worried that a death the soul disperses. Right? So Why does he say this? He says the majority of men think that, but obviously he's thinking, I'm worried too. I'm putting it up for a lie, right? But I am worried. And so in all of these ways, plus there's this huge amount of vocabulary which Plato in general doesn't use and say in the Republic hardly uses at all, but this kaphalmas purification. There's a lot of talk about initiation here too. Um, and the whole idea, the Orphic Pythagorean idea that the soul is imprisoned in the body or in bondage in the body. So there's all of this vocabulary from that tradition, as well as these characters from the tradition being confused. Um, it's thought that it pretty clearly shows that he's engaging, um, right. engaging with them. Because right in the days before footnotes, how there's no way to be more clear than that. That this, this is what I'm talking about by using right, by both a biographical connection to the characters and repeating some of the language. Right. right, that's fairly interesting. Yeah. <laughs> well, Connie, that was so interesting. Mm -hmm. And please stay and bear with us. We'll be right out. Thank you so much for that talk. Thank you for coming. <laughs>